Michael, you've got some pretty interesting crops here, and some of them I know and some of them I don't. So, you know, please tell us about them. Thank you. Well, this particular crop here is the celosia, uh -huh. or the Nigerian spinach, or featherscum, featherscoscum. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an edible, but here usually it's grown as an uh, ornamental. Yes, I use it in gardens all the time. Absolutely. Yes. But uh, within West Africa, they eat the leaves. Eat, leaves are extremely taste delicious. Do they stir fry them? They or? stir fry. You okay. cook them with garlic and onions and, you know, saute it and it's excellent. You also eat it as raw as a salad as well. Well, I'm going to go home and try some. I've got some growing at home. As long as they're not the ornamental type, but the edible type. Oh, okay. Yeah. I gotcha. <laughs> all right. Yeah. But then there is a plant that I'm very familiar with that probably a lot of people aren't familiar with. Very good. This is the, um, crop, the, the, the tree that kind of gets everybody up in the morning. Yeah. This is known as coffee. <laughs> so this is the coffee plant here. Uh -huh. The coffee plant originates in Ethiopia. Uh, Kenyans grow it quite a bit as well. Uh, Ethiopia is the home of coffee and it's one of those plants that came over after colonization as well and became our choice or beverage of choice for, for morning breakfast. Yes, waking everybody up. Interesting. Mm -hmm. The crops though, I mean, I, I know coffee is probably a unique plant to bring over here to Richmond, Virginia or Central Virginia mm -hmm. to grow. So how did you make choices such as just these two alone on, you know, what, how do you determine whether you think it's going to grow here? Well, I, I bring plants over for different reasons. Uh, one, some for just educational purposes. We're mm -hmm. exposing individuals to, i.e., coffee, yes. something that you partake of every day and have no idea its origin, where it comes from, and ultimately what it looks like. Other crops like Nigerian spinach, I would bring over because I understand that it's uh, much more hardy, uh, drought tolerant, and can grow in our summers. And can grow, you know, I can replant it. Uh, it grows pretty much by seed now. It drops seeds plentifully. Uh, so now I have about maybe four or five uh, rows of this crop all over the fields. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. But this is one right here that uh, it's a solanum, and we're all used mm -hmm. to the nightshade family, mm -hmm. but you were sharing that this one is edible. Right. This is called Managu, uh -huh. which is out of uh, Kenya mm -hmm. and East Africa, and the leaves are actually eaten. Uh, it's related to the huckleberry. Uh, Interesting. And, yeah. And there's several uh, solanum that are edible, that we, they eat the leaves. Uh, one is called Boma uh, in Liberia and Sierra Leone and some other places they eat the potato leaves. Um, so just like the tomato was kind of forbidden in the early 1800s mm -hmm. uh, and 1700s, you also had uh, the leaves saying that they weren't be able to be eaten. Uh, so presently, uh, the leaves of these plants can be eaten and has been eaten for eons in Kenya and in some parts of West Africa. Interesting. Soil though, what's the soil like? Because we have very heavy clay soil over there. In my conception, my, my thoughts are the soil is not heavy clay over in Kenya. There are some heavy clays. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There are some very much heavy clays in Kenya. I've seen heavy clays in Burkina Faso as well as in Ghana. Interesting. Um, so the biggest thing for a lot of growing, a lot of these crops is soil temperature. Oh. So once the soil temperatures get about 65 or so, they will grow anything that you can grow in West Africa. With the exception of trees, because as soon as they, as soon as the uh, ground freezes, they'll yeah. die back. Yeah, right? they'll die back. Uh, but a lot of these grow, and I generally, we start planting around May, probably uh, Mother's Day weekend, mm -hmm. a little bit after that, and it will grow all the way until about October, to our first freeze. Interesting. Well, we want to get on to the other questions. So this plant here, this is what I call a sensitive type plant, mm -hmm. which means when you touch the leaves, it just collapses. Correct. So tell me more about this one. Well, this is a sensitive plant, as you said, uh, Puduca yeah. mimosa. Uh, I first discovered this tree or noticed this, this plant in West Africa. And I was just amazed by its ability to be the introvert that it is yes. and be so proud to be introvert. Because uh, right now it's showing its introverted ways. It surely by, has <laughs> shut down. Yes. It shut down after the ride. Uh -huh. uh, and my father, who's a 35-year uh, agriculture teacher, when he saw this plant, he was amazed. He played with it for like five, ten minutes. Oh, poor plant. <laughs> in the garden. Uh, but this is a great plant for children as well as adults to really get them engaged into the garden and into the farm. Uh, a lot of plants that we grow, again, I try to attract plants. We have a lot of trap plants for people. Mm -hmm. So we try to bring plants. Trap plants for people. I just caught that. <laughs> <laughs> so we try to bring in plants that like people are like, oh, ooh, ah, and they can actually relate it to them and really challenge the stigma that's associated with agriculture and especially African Americans. So we can really, uh, done, uh, really focus on the Africans and the African contributions to agriculture. And in that way, it engages individuals another kind of way in terms of learning things on the farm besides your pigs, your sows, yeah. um, your cattle and things like that. Right. Well, speaking of African contributions, there's a very significant man in our history mm -hmm. that made a huge difference in Southern agriculture. We've got just one or two minutes. Could you share us 
Well, Dr. George Washington Carver was a tremendous uh, scientist and agricultural innovator and conservationist. Uh -huh. And he really conserved agriculture as a whole. Uh, he brought in, utilized three plants. Two of those are of African descent, the soybean, I'm not sorry, not the soybean, the sweet potato, and the peanut or the groundnut, or what he preferred as the goober. Uh -huh. uh, and utilized that to revitalize the uh, agriculture industry in the South, which ultimately revitalized the agriculture economy uh, within the whole country. Because I think people forget that the whole economy was three crops. Mm -hmm. It was cotton, it was basically... Um, Tobacco, Tobacco and, and corn. corn. Mm -hmm. And the, all of those rape the soil. Absolutely. So utilizing uh, the soybean and the peanut, he actually revitalized the soil by fixing nitrogen back into the soil uh, with those legumes. Yes. Uh, and then utilizing the sweet potato to uh, expand or, or create... Um, More air pockets and things? Air pockets, exactly, uh, with, with those plants. And then we know him for being uh, what they call the peanut man. Yes. But it became, he was really the value-added producer. Yes. or farmer. He created 300 different ways of showing value of how to utilize the peanuts so that the farmer could actually create crops they could generate income from. You know, he's amazing in that we were, don't give this man the proper due for how he turned around the agriculture industry of the South at a time that it was at its, its lowest. Exactly. And that's what we try to do at the farm is kind of give various individuals their recognition and their due. To not just uh, to don't they, to note them as a single person, as a peanut guy or the cola guy or the chocolate guy but really talk about their contribution in terms of changing agriculture in the United States of America. Oh, sounds great, because my, my memory from grade school uh, is of a very distinguished black man who's mm -hmm. in a lab coat doing research. Yes. And I think that's the kind of memory we need to have for such a fine American. So ah, thank so you. Great. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you.